So just very quickly, a couple of uh, housekeeping rules. We do have translation for those of you who are bilingually challenged, that's okay. Uh, you're a part of the uh, growing majority in this country. Um, we have three fantastic panelists joining us this afternoon to have a, a conversation on drug policy and immigration reform, bridging the gap and keeping families together. My name is Armando Gudinho, Drug Policy Manager in the State of California for the Drug Policy Alliance. Uh, based out of the city of Los Angeles. And uh, how's everybody doing? Good. All right. All right, good. You guys are awake. I'll be honest. I was thinking when I first saw the schedule, Saturday afternoon, most of you are going to come in here hungover at those crudos, but now I see you guys are the ones that are keeping it straight. Congratulations. Thank you very much. Thanks for being here. Uh, believe it or not, when I started the conference, uh, I came out here a little bit before the conference started, and I've had a full head of hair, so it goes to show you how, how stressful this experience has been. So today, uh, let me, one additional housekeeping rule or housekeeping issue. The panelists listed on this book, some of them had some other work-related uh, issues that came up, and as it is in this type of work, sometimes we need to do a little bit of switching, so we ended up even with a, a better group of panelists, all right? So that said, I am going to pro uh, provide uh, a description of who our panelists are, unlike some other uh, events today or throughout the conference that just went into the topic and conversation. Uh, with us, our first speaker is Marco Castillo. He's a social anthropologist, former director and founder of the Institute of Social and Cultural Investigation and Practice, where he focused uh, on several issues, among others, uh, which include justice and equality in the border regions of U.S., Mexico, and Central America. After moving on through a couple of other uh, prominent organizations, today he uh, coordinates the Mexico-based Popular Assembly of Migrant Families. Now, I should have said this before I bring up Marco and before I read his bio, his brief bio. One of the things that I'm hoping we can achieve here today, right, as we came together and discussed this panel, and discuss the topic, I'm hoping to be able to bring to you guys a view, a look into the macro problem that is immigration, migration of people, in particular from Latin America, in the context of the war on drugs. And Marco is very uh, important to this topic because he's gonna be able to give us an insight into the causes of migration in Mexico and other places. What is causing this, this horrific, and, and catastrophic, life-changing events in people that are making them flee. From there, we're gonna bring it a bit more focus and go back to the United States. And let me say, we all know, it's like a documentary. We can't cover all issue areas, so we focus on one. We're, go we're then gonna go to our second panelist, Grace Meng, who is a researcher with Human Rights Watch. We'll go into her bio a little bit later on. And she's gonna focus it a little bit more in one particular area that is, in effect, a second and devastating impact of the war on drugs. Having fled the violence, having fled the causes to come to another country, many seeking a form of asylum, fleeing the violence, and then here again, they're hit with another form of political violence. And then we're gonna wrap it up with our third speaker, an attorney who specializes on these issues, and provide an example, just one example of one of the things that we can do and are trying to do here in the States to address the issues, the impact of the war on drugs, and all of this with regard to the issue of the immigrant community. Third rail of politics, ladies and gentlemen. Across the board, especially within the war on drugs. One of the things that we found out, those of us that are on this panel, many of you who are here, that we know is that within the drug policy reform movement, immigration is a, a delicate issue, right? You want to pass significant legislation, but you're afraid to include immigrants. We've seen this in California with other legislation that went to, 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 to sought to minimize the impact of political uh, uh, or, or um, prosecution of certain laws, but we decided to keep out immigrants from that issue. So we had to come up with other ways. Yeah, these are important issues, so I want you guys to listen. Don't just hear what they're going to say, listen. Because I think this is, I think, the only panel in this conference that's exclusively looking at the issue of immigration, right? I see a couple heads, right? And considering that there's tens of millions of immigrants in this country, both legal and, and 
both uh, uh, per with permits and non-permitted. Frankly, we're behind the eight ball. So with that, I bring up Marco Castillo to give us the first and important analysis on the causes of migration. Marco. And you don't have to come up. In fact, feel free to stay there, brother. <laughs> okay. <laughs> All right. Thank you, and hi, everybody. Um, I can't promise I won't be switching from English to Spanish. I'm sorry for the translators. I'll, I'll, I'm trying to do this in English, and I'm going to do it. I feel more comfortable with it, but uh, sometimes I might just switch from one to other. Um, I would like to begin by sharing with you a little bit of the work that I do. Uh, for the past four, for 14 years, we've been dedicating ourselves to work with immigrant communities in communities of origin and return. So we are working in Mexico with those who remain while others migrate. Basically, mothers, wives, children of those who come to the United States and work. Uh, through, through this work, we've been able to see and witness the... Um, some of the uh, consequences and causes of, of the root causes of forest migration. And obviously it's links with uh, a systemic issue of criminalization of communities, of indigenous communities, of communities of color, and uh, how that is directly related with the so-called war on drugs. And uh, so, through this work, for example, in 2012, we did the Caravan for Peace, which some of my colleagues are here. In that Caravan for Peace, we were able for the first time to try to be very explicit about the links and crossing points between migration and, and uh, war on drugs. Sometimes it seems like they're separate discussions, separate debates, and, at, and in the end, we discovered that we are walking the same paths. We, we're, we're unfortunately sh sharing a tragedy. And, uh, and yeah, it's basically the same routes. It's basically informal economy that it's benefiting some at the expense of the life of others. And yes, I would say just that in general. And to go right now into the issue, um, I would say that migration and the drug war are both evidences of an economic and political system that sustains itself through inequality. Just by looking at the numbers, more than 70,000 disappearances in Mexico in less than, since, since 2010, I would say approximately, and more than 6.6 .6 million undocumented migrants in the United States, it's more than a clear evidence that uh, these uh, numbers show us how, how this is something that it's giving benefits to a handful of people at the expense of millions of others who are being displaced uh, through migration or because of violence. Many of the communities where, where all of these things happen, meaning migration or displacements of violence, are very rich communities, full of resources that could have provided opportunities, economic opportunities, for those who live in there. There's a clear intention of pushing people out in order to insert them in, the, in, economic, in an economic system, whether it's informal, such as you know, drug trade, or, or uh, unregulated labor, um, such as migration. Meanwhile, many businesses and consumers, whether it's drugs or restaurants or whatever in the U.S. have been benefiting out of the, out of the violence and out of forced migration. That's another uh, point that we share. Uh, so migrant labor is cheap and some drugs are cheap because of this. And, and so uh, this kind of, of capitalist thinking uh, brings benefits and sometimes we don't realize what is going on behind it. Uh, so, from that market perspective, who would be interested then in ending this money-making machine? Obviously, there's, there's an intention of keeping things the way they are. Uh, in both countries, so 
Communities of color be have been pu pushed out into poverty and violence to, uh, to insert them in informal economy and, and or criminalizing them. Such, I already talked about this, but I would like to be explicit about two cases. One, I would like to talk about Santo Domingo Guerrero. This community in Guerrero started uh, to grow uh, marijuana and, and during the World War, I yes, Second World War probably, and then Vietnam, just at the demand of the US government, people began to you know, grow it and then they would ship it in the coast to send it to the US. Uh, US uh, submarines will come and, and take the, the weed and then just bring it to the soldiers in, uh, uh, abroad. And um, also at the same time, many of these communities in Guerrero were recruited to build the, you know, the railroads and, and uh, many of, of the basic infrastructure of this country. And then, uh, so we have right now uh, binational community. Many of the people that we work in the state of Guerrero, they all are, many of them are residents, U.S. citizens. But, but situations have changed drastically, and now this same community in Guerrero, it's uh, criminalized, it's taken by the drug, drug cartels, and people is living under uh, incredibly violent circumstances. This binational community where the grow of marijuana have been sponsored by the U.S. government is today killing and disappearing children and women almost on a weekly basis. And um, how unfortunate uh, this is. And um, so it's a transnational issue. And many of, of the young kids who have dual citizenship are a perfect target for many of the drug cartels because they can be sent here with, uh, with uh, I don't know, to smuggle uh, drugs or, or whether it's to bring people. So uh, it's definitely a binational issue. I just want to add to this exam example then that what is happening in Mexico, it's not only responsibility of Mexico. It's every day much more a transnational issue. We are more than neighbors. We have become family and families, and many, many, many of the drug lords have, have a passport, have a US passport, have a green card, including, including El Chapo, obviously. We all know that. Okay, and the second example I wanna, uh, I wanna share, every, every week, every week, 260 migrants are being flied into Mexico City through a private, Charter plane uh, every week. 260 mostly men are being sent to Mexico City after deportation, and uh, many of them uh, after being charged with nonviolent cases. And uh, obviously, all of them are being separated from their families. We are receiving again every week at the airport 260. Uh, just in Mexico City, through the through the deep deportation program, that uh, and and uh, this is important to mention because many of these kids that are being sent to Mexico City go there after never ever have lived in Mexico. They are basically born and raised in the, in the in the U.S. and after going through a deportation and then showing up in Mexico City, all of a sudden they have no connection to their community. They have no connection to the country. Some, some of them, not even, they don't even speak Spanish. And uh, they have no opportunities. And the Mexican government obviously is doing nothing to uh, take advantage of the presence of this population. And instead of that, uh, the organized crime has been taking advantage of them. And so they're being re-recruited again and being inserted in a cycle of going back and forward in a uh, double or triple criminalized uh, sector of, of the economy. And many of, this, of these kids end up homeless in Mexico City or other capital cities, uh, obviously jobless, and many of them and uh, being, again, recruited by organized crime. 
um, I would just end by saying, under these circumstances, a piece of legislation will not be enough if it doesn't speak a different language and if it doesn't incorporate migrant communities a transnational perspective, a regional perspective over the issues that we are facing, and if it's not connected from a human rights perspective, the different dots of one single strategy, which is the war on drugs, which is affecting many, many people. Not only uh, users, not only producers, but many of their families or the communities of color that are linked to this uh, unfortunate strategy. That's it. Thank you. Marco, thank you very much. I just want to highlight a couple of things, folks, that Marco referenced uh, in his brief uh, time with us here. 70,000 disappeared. And those estimates, you know, go up, down, depending on who you ask. But 70,000 people have disappeared. 6.6 .6 million people have, through migration, displacement, and violence, is what Marco said in one form or another, been pushed out to become unregulated labor and part of the informal economy, all of which, who is reaping the benefits? We are, this country, those of us in this room. And that's what it is, folks, all right? Transnational issue is what Marco is telling us. Every week, 260 migrants flown to Mexico City after deportations for petty drug crimes, which is a great segue to our next speaker. But as Grace Mann comes up here and talks to us, keep in mind what Marco just put in context for us, right? That a lot of these young people, a lot of these older people, young men and, and young boys, and sure there's women in the mix, are being essentially in a class of their own, not even recognized. Some of them are becoming homeless. Some of them are being caught back into the cycle of organized crime, which in turn perpetuates the very violence that we are here today saying we want to end, end the war on drugs. This is a key issue that really highlights that if we don't address the immigration issue, ladies and gentlemen, we're not gonna end the war on drugs. If we don't address the migration issue, the displacement issue, the violence issue in Mexico. Because as Marco said, we're no longer neighbors. Hell, we haven't been neighbors for a long time. I mean, you, whether you want to start with NAFTA or generations before NAFTA, hell, we can go back to those of us who have been here since Mexico decided to stumble across the, uh, the ocean and come on, or I'm sorry, the US decided to stumble across the border and come on over and claim it for themselves. 260 migrants flown into Mexico City for petty drug crimes. Our next speaker, who's gonna join up here and drop me off my little podium, which I, as you can tell, I'm enjoying, is Grace Meng. That's my boss laughing, by the way, but she knows it. She's a senior researcher in the US program at Human Rights Watch. Investigates, she investigates abuses in the US immigration system. Her research and advocacy have covered sexual violence and harassment uh, experienced by farm worker women and girls, abuse following um, enhancements of Alabama's anti-immigration law, the, step, uh, the steep rise in criminal border prosecutions of migrants, and how deportations for drug offenses have torn U.S. families apart. Grace is a graduate, graduate of Yale College and Yale Law School. And this uh, is the report that Grace will be speaking to. Um, Grace, you have the floor. Welcome. Thanks, Armando. Hi, everyone. Thanks so much for being here. Um, I work for Human Rights Watch. If you're not familiar with our organization, we're an international, independent, nonprofit. Uh, we document human rights abuses all over the world. We have uh, issued reports on the disappeared in Mexico, documenting how many people have, uh, have, been, have disappeared because of the drug war. Um, we've issued reports on so-called rehabilitation centers in Southeast Asia, where um, people are abused rather than helped. Um, and in the U.S., my work has focused on 
how the immigration system intersects with the criminal justice system. Um, and I think the best way for me to explain to you why this issue is so important to me and why I hope it will be so important to you um, is illustrated best by the story of a man I met this year. Uh, this is Jose Francisco Gonzalez and his family, um, his partner, Pita Sanchez, their nine-year-old daughter. Um, I met uh, Pita and Jose in Anaheim, California this year. Um, Last year, in April 2014, uh, Jose and Pita were woken at 6.30 a.m. by a knock on their door. Uh, when Pita opened the door, there were five or six uniformed men with guns, dogs. They were there to arrest Jose. You might wonder, what did Jose do? Uh, Jose is a green card holder. He's been in the U.S. for over 30 years. He spent most of his life you know, working hard in various jobs until he was disabled. He's actually on crutches now. Um, and they came and took him away. Um, he actually doesn't even have a record. Um, he does have a drug arrest, and this is sort of an interesting story. Um, in 2001, police came to Jose's apartment complex looking for a lost child. They saw two pot plants on his balcony. Uh, Jose says they were his brothers. I don't care who they were. Regardless, he was arrested for marijuana cultivation. Um, but because it was so obviously for personal use, in California, he was offered a diversion program called Deferred Entry of Judgment. And in this program, you plead guilty, um, you complete the program, and when you're done, you're promised that you have no record. You can even honestly answer if an employer asks you, have you ever been arrested? You can say no. So Jose did this, he did everything they asked. He thought he had put it behind him, he had a clean record, it was his only arrest. He never expected that 13 years later, immigration would come to arrest him. They took him to Adelanto, a detention center, two hours east of LA. He has a ton of health problems. He ended up bleeding on the floor of his cell. He was hospitalized multiple times. PETA didn't even know where he was. They wouldn't tell her because they say it's a security issue. Um, he was finally released because of his medical problems, but he's still in deportation proceedings. He's being charged with uh, being an aggravated felon as being a drug trafficker because his conviction uh, or so-called conviction, um, includes marijuana cultivation, which includes an element of sale. So this is, I think, a really good example of how um, immigration law has not caught up with reforms in the criminal justice system. You know, I think all of us here, we are not satisfied with where reform is in the criminal justice system. We want to see more, but we can agree that a lot has changed. You know, the discourse has changed, the rhetoric has changed. I've had DAs and, and police officers tell me, oh, I don't care about misdemeanor possession. Um, that's not the way immigration sees it. Um, and this is not at all a minor problem. So uh, this is based on data we received from uh, Immigration and Customs Enforcement through a Freedom of Information Act request. From 2007 to 2012, over a quarter of a million people who were deported had a drug offense as their most serious conviction. And you can see the numbers have gone up. They started to taper down, and 2013, which we have a slightly different set of data, shows a, a decrease again, but there really was a ramp up. The most common type of conduct was possession. And I think what's really striking in this data is that the number of people deported for drug possession increased 43% over these five years. So not only is this a huge problem, it's a growing problem. Um, a quarter of deportations involved marijuana offenses, like Jose's, and 34,000 people who were deported had as their most serious conviction uh, a conviction for marijuana possession. Um, I think the data, um, to me is quite shocking, it's very striking, but it's in no way really captures what's going on. Um, there are several issues, several reasons why I think this is an issue that the drug reform movement should really take up. Um, not only is it a big and growing problem, it's very much based in the drug war. Um, the same laws that say that you can be deported for almost any drug offense. If you have a green card in this room, you might think, oh, I'm fine, I'm here legally. If you have anything other than one conviction for possessing 30 grams of marijuana or less, you are deportable. You can be subject to mandatory detention. That means you are gonna be held without an opportunity for bond until your hearing is over. Um, if that conviction involves any element of sale, I've met a woman from Jamaica, lived in the Bronx for 30 years. 
she sold $10 worth of crack cocaine to a cop in 1995, to an undercover cop, she is being uh, facing deportation, automatic deportation, as an aggravated felon and a drug trafficker. They do not take any offense lightly. Um, it can be expunged, it can be pardoned, it doesn't matter. If your conviction is a drug offense, pardoned offenses can still get you deported. Um, let's say you want to immigrate, you want to become a, a permanent resident. I interviewed a woman, a Canadian graphic designer, um, She's in her mid-40s now. When she was 18, she got a conviction for possessing cocaine. She was in her senior year of high school. Um, in Canada, her record has been sealed. It's over. She's moved on with her life. She has a US citizen fiance. The US government will not give her a visa to enter the US as a permanent resident. And she says her daughter doesn't understand why she can't go live with this man that she's come to see as her father. Um, and, you know, as this woman said to me, this is now a life sentence for two people I love who never did anything. It's something that I did. Um, and 30 years later, actually 20 years later, she's still paying the price. Um, which gets me to my third point. Um, this is an issue that not only affects the people with the convictions, with the records. Uh, this affects their children, their families. Um, so many people I met told me that their children, after having their parents detained and deported, suffered in school, they started acting up. Um, people end up, um, they lose their breadwinner, they end up on welfare. I actually met a man who told me that, um, a green card holder who ended up in detention for three months because he had two marijuana possession convictions <laughs> from 10 years earlier. Um, he told me that his wife had to drop out of school uh, because he had been locked up. Uh, and she, a US citizen, is eligible for welfare benefits. When she went to apply, um, they told her she had to sue her husband for child support first. Uh, it didn't matter that the US government had put him there, that he had, all he wanted was to be home taking care of his family. Um, and I think for those reasons, I mean, these are reasons that many people have really taken up the drug reform movement, that we care about families and communities, that we don't think that um, entire families should be punished for the action of, some, of one person. And that even that one person should not be punished for the rest of his life. If we think that someone should not serve 20, 30 years for a drug offense, why should they be exiled? Why should they be permanently separated from their families? Because deportation for a drug offense is permanent. You will never be allowed to come back and live with your family. It doesn't matter how many years have passed. It doesn't matter what you've done with your life since. You can beg until you're blue in the face. The U.S. government will not give you a green card again. Um, so those are, you know, the reasons why I think this is an issue that the drug reform movement should take up. I hope I have persuaded you, um, and I hope that you will want to persuade others. And I think Jose, when he talks about um, a new law that we um, helped to pass in California, um, will explain why this law is going to help Jose um, and why we hope that you will want to pass similar laws in your states. Thank you, uh, Grace. So, before we go to Jose in a minute, I just want to, again, recap. I think it's important to, to do this personally um, because, you know, a lot of times we come to these events, these conferences, and it's information overload, right? I mean, we've been coming to several workshops, seminars, que se yo, man, you know, events, parties, the día y noche, man, no se acaba. So, again, let's recap, right? We started off with Marco, 70,000 disappeared, 6.6 .6 million uh, through migration, displacement, and violence, unregulated labor, a transnational issue. Every week, 260 migrants are flown into Mexico, and eventually, many of them get recycled into organized crime. In the meantime, let me ask you guys, Quick question going back to what Grace just talked about. Silly question, who here has family? Everybody, everybody. We all have brothers and sisters, cousins and aunts, mothers and fathers. Some have a little bit more of these, some have a little bit more of us, of those. You know, um, this issue is as much about the war on drugs as it is about the losing of family. It's as much about us fighting to keep families together, right? The numbers speak for themselves, ladies and gentlemen. A quarter of a million drug offense possession. The number's growing, 34% 30, increase. 
according to a Human Rights Watch report, the author of whom is sitting here before us. Yet again, we find an example of how the human experience, the migrant immigrant experience, is beat on, is displaced. This war on drugs is devastating the home. They flee to this country only to be yet again pounded on and beat on by the same war on drugs that we're fighting. This is the second time around. There is ways that we can affect change. Many of those ways we already know. Ending the war, economic opportunities, responsible immigration reform, right? Our next speaker is a gentleman um, who comes to us by way of, he, first of all, let me just say for the record, he abandoned us Californians. <laughs> so I'm just gonna pick out Jose a little bit for that. <laughs> Uh, where he spent most of his time in San Francisco, but uh, is now working here as a legislative staff attorney with MALDEF, the Mexican American Legal Defense and Education Fund. Uh, he is leading its national immigration portfolio. Currently, he is an immigration policy attorney at the Immigrant Legal uh, Resource Center, focusing on uh, regulatory advocacy, legislative strategy, and community education. He holds his degrees from Arizona State University in Tempe, Arizona, uh, that's his bachelor's and his law degree from Baylor University in Waco, Texas. Ladies and gentlemen, Jose Magaña Salgado from the Immigrant Legal Resource Center. And Jose is going to give us a little bit more on this example. Come on up, Jose. On, in California, the Drug Policy Alliance partnered with uh, Human Rights Watch, the Immigrant Legal Resource Center, MALDEF, NCLR, CHIDLA, a couple other organizations. And we actually made an attempt at this uh, deferred entry of judgment. We tried to put together what we lovingly call a bit of a wraparound, where we tried changing the order in which these proceedings are executed, right? And I'll let Jose get into the detail. Describe a little bit, Jose, what is deferred entry of judgment, what we tried to do, and put it in the context of how a failed immigration or the lack of immigration reform uh, contributes to yet again this second pounding of migrants and immigrants. That sounds great. Thank you so much, Armando. Good afternoon. Can you guys hear me without the mic? Is that okay? No, no not with the translator. So we're going to use the mic. All right. So my name is Jose Magaña Salgado, and California is actually very near and dear to my heart. And that is because when I first entered the country, I entered in California. And I entered on a very special visa. It's a visa that you get by going up to the border, looking both ways, <laughs> and then running across. <laughs> and so the reason that I do this work is because of my own personal narrative, and that is that I am still not technically supposed to be in the country. So if you could not tell the federal government where I am, um, I'm very lucky to hold deferred action for childhood arrivals, which basically means that the government is going to deport me, but I'm not at the top of their list, which is kind of nice. Um, and so with that background, I previously organized at the grassroots level and saw the impact that the criminalization of communities of color had in the immigration context. Um, when I first came, I was two years old. And I will actually be visiting Mexico for the first time in 26 years in December. And ideally, they will let me back in. So, um, and so people always ask me what it's like to do federal immigration policy. And I want you to picture something. I want you to picture a hill. And at the bottom of this hill is a very large boulder. And I want you to picture pushing that boulder ever so painfully all the way to the top of the hill and then watching it roll back down on top of you crushing you. I wish immigration reform was that productive. <laughs> and so basically what I'm gonna talk about today is kind of the federal immigration framework because you all are hearing a lot of these things and you're probably thinking to yourself, hey, we should fix the federal system, which we should. Uh, but in light of an action, a lot of those battles have been taken to the state level, which I'll talk about and give the example of California. 
Now, since it's been two decades since we've had major reform, um, we've had so many obstacles being able to bring federal immigration reform. Obstacles like a lot of congressional members don't have a reason to vote for reform because their districts are filled with um, non-people of color. Not only that, but throughout this entire debate, you have this underlying theme of fear of the other and xenophobia. And so immigration is a very volatile issue. And when you combine that with issues such as drug issues, it becomes even more volatile. And as was, was said before, while everyone in our nation has recognized that we have criminalized individuals in the criminal justice system and we need to reduce that criminalization, that epiphany has not occurred in the immigration context. And as Grace so accurately depicted, the consequences of that are very, very serious. So in light of that, and in light of the serious consequences of the federal system, we have turned to the state level. And so before I move from the federal system, I'm sure some of you have heard that the Bureau of Prisons uh, is or has released about 6,000 individuals uh, based on an assessment that they're not a threat to public safety and as a result of the U.S. Sentencing Commission's uh, recommendations. 2,000 of those people were either undocumented or lawful permanent residents, mostly with drug convictions. Virtually all of them have or will be deported. So even though they've served their sentence, even though a judge has said that they're not a threat to public safety, because our immigration system essentially double punishes people, once through the criminal justice system and second through the immigration system, we have communities of color, particularly immigrants, being devastated. So in light of this, many organizations reshifted their focus. They said, you know what we're gonna do? We're gonna look at the state level and we're gonna see what we can do there. And based on grassroots activity and the work of great nonprofits such as Human Rights Watch and ILRC in California, we have assessed and had certain victories. So in California, we have things like the Trust Act, where it makes it harder for localities to cooperate with federal law enforcement in order to preserve that trust between the community and local police. We have things like providing professional licenses to undocumented individuals, the California Dream Act, and other laws that help immigrants while the federal reform efforts stall. And in the context of California, um, the concept of this deferred entry of judgment is something that uh, we took a look at and helped pass a law. Two laws, I'm gonna talk about two laws today, one which was unfortunately vetoed and one that wasn't. Um, so basically, what you need to know about expungements is as follows. Our immigration system does not care if your conviction has been expunged. Expungement only helps in one small circumstance, and that's when there was an expungement for a legal cause. There was a legal error. And so in all these situations where you have an expungement um, like Jose, it doesn't matter. So what California did is um, what a lot of the NGOs did is they proposed this law that basically said, hey, if you get charged with a drug offense, we're gonna let you plead not guilty, complete the treatment program, and then have the charges dismissed. And that way, there is no conviction for the purposes of state or the federal government. The current system is you get charged, you plead guilty, you complete the treatment program, and then you get the charges dismissed. And that small distinction, <laughs> Whether you pled guilty, even though everything else was identical, makes a world of difference. Now, unfortunately, that piece of legislation, which was uh, AB 1351, was vetoed by the governor, which is something we're not Ooh. happy. Yeah, yeah, boo, boo him, yeah. But we did get a small victory in AB 1352. And that basically said, okay, immigrants who have had this situation happen, who pled guilty and now unknowingly are subject to these harsh immigration consequences. We are gonna let you withdraw your plea on the basis of a legal defect. And that legal defect is you didn't know that when you pled guilty, you were gonna have these severe immigration consequences. As a result, because of that type of legal expungement, the federal government will recognize and hopefully not deport those individuals. But the problem is because AB 1351 was not enacted, we're gonna have people be charged, plead guilty, do diversion programs, 
and then apply for AB 1352 to get the expungement. Um, so it would have made sense to have both components move forward. So this is a small example of some of the efforts that are happening in California and some of the efforts that can happen on the state level. So many of you have the opportunity to replicate this sort of advocacy and make a difference while federal immigration reform moves along at an incredibly slow pace. Um, so with that being said, um, that's it. I can hope you uh, take this back to your own states and please let me know if you have any questions. Thank you, Jose. A round of applause for Jose. All right, so we're actually working with about 15 minutes, right, Charlotte? So about 15 minutes. Um, key point that Jose just brought up. This is one example, and I'm gonna go to questions in a bit. One example of what we can do at the state level to start chipping away at this giant monster that is immigration, the intersection of immigration and drug policy reform. The third rail of many issues in the political arena, including the drug reform movement, because as I said uh, in my opening statements, this is one issue that many within the drug policy reform movement still don't want to touch, still don't understand, and still don't care, ladies and gentlemen. And this is something that is a big challenge to us because those of us that work in the criminal justice issue areas uh, you know, do exactly that and sometimes feel, well, that's my issue. Great, I, re I respect and understand the harm reduction component, but that's not my area. And then, and then the vice versa. Well, you know, I do harm reduction. And criminal justice got it, part of the issue areas of drug policy reform, but that's not my area. And then those of us that are strictly advocating on the marijuana front, hell, there are some out there, as we heard in, the, in one of the recent panels here at this conference, why should I care about social justice issues? Right? Yeah, I see all the heads moving around. So, you know, the challenge is, is there for us as individuals. Ultimately, if we're committed to ending the war on drugs, if we are determined to make an impact, you know, we have to look at all areas, including these areas that involve the persecution of people from one country to another, and then when we hit them here again, and we can't stand idle. We're going to take some, uh, some questions. I'm going to go from left to right, considering that I have a long history of being on the left. Don't tell that to anybody. And by the way, I did already have one young brother and somebody else come up to me and say, Armando, I'm really interested on this issue. want to talk to you more. And of course, I'm going to be sending them right back to Jose and our panelists to learn more about it. Don't ask me to let go of the mic because I'm not going to. So we'll go to the first question. I am a microphone hog, and I am a lot bigger than you. How's it going? Um, so, I'm Carlos, I'm from Arizona, and we're running the campaign to regulate marijuana like alcohol there. And Arizona's got a big population of Latinos um, that are active in registering to vote, but when it comes time to vote, it, they don't. They represent about 20% of all registered voters in Arizona, and about 60% of those don't go out to the polls on election day. And I think this is, these two issues um, kind of tie up well together and would bring people out. If you could, just in my mind, I was thinking about some messaging. Um, if you were to put all this in some talking points, I, I'm not gonna say three or four, but any talking points that you would, uh, what would those be and, and who, how would you advocate to the Latino community in Arizona? So, Carlos from MPP, right, Carlos? Yeah, so um, how do we put all this together into one group of talking points? And I'll leave that up to any of you. Grace, you wanna take a crack at it? Jose, pass. Sure. Um, so I am not an organizer. Uh, I'm not so good at the, the rally and cry. Um, but I do think that, um, you know, with, I mean, actually, a lot of the drug reforms have been tricky for um, immigrants. Like in Colorado, I had an immigration and criminal defense lawyer tell me he supported marijuana legalization, but um, now there is no uh, safe plea. There is nothing that people who are arrested for drug offenses can plead to that because before you could plead to 30 grams or less of marijuana and that could help you avoid deportation and now there's nothing because there's no criminal offense to plead to. Um, that said, you know, fewer people who are arrested, fewer people who are entering the system, fewer people who are um, on notice to immigration authorities, you know, I think that that pipeline can really be affected by, by decriminalizing and legalizing um, drug offenses. So, you know, I think that um, it's... Uh, it's definitely a little bit of a, 
a leap to kind of step beyond like, okay, let's legalize this one drug or regulate this one drug to families. But to me, that's at the heart of, that's, so many people get that. You know, when I, when I talk to my mother, who isn't really interested in a lot of the <laughs> issues that I'm interested in, but if I say, can you believe this mother is gonna get deported because she got you know, arrested for pot and then the ICE found out about her? I mean, that, that sounds awful, you know? And I think that um, there is a tendency in the mainstream immigrant rights movement um, not to want to talk about the people who do get arrested for drug offenses or any right. offenses because they keep being told that they're criminals for entering the country uh, illegally. And so the response is, we are not criminals. Um, but then that ends up excluding people who actually do have criminal records. Um, so I think you know, part of it is, have, is a longer term conversation with immigration reform advocates. You know, how do they include people who have records as well? But also just bringing it back to, you know, let's, let's not just talk about, I mean, that's why for me, um, as a human rights organization, you know, the right to family unity is so basic. It's not abstract, because we all have families. You know, we all can imagine what it'd be like to be told by a government that you can't live with your family. I mean, I cannot think of, I mean, to me, that is a truly horrendous government action um, to take. Uh, so, you know, I, I, that's, that's the goal for me, you know, to keep bringing a lot of these discussions around, oh, what will we do to regulate a drug? You know, how will it actually impact families? How will it impact children? How will it impact, I mean, in California, you know, when we worked on this law, we went around telling people over and over, 50% of children in California have at least one foreign-born parent. I mean, this is not just about the people who are arrested. This is about what's going to happen to their families. And, and probably nor is it exclusive to California in terms of having one foreign-born uh, family member. Uh, I imagine that there's some truth to that in places like Arizona and others. And we can certainly work with you on some of the language that we came up with in terms of the message, messaging on the issue. But key to what Grace just brought up, um, I think involving those groups most affected is really key to this because it, it allows buy-in as well. But uh, can give us your name and where, where you're from. Caprice, I'm from New Haven, Connecticut. And New Haven is looking to implement, hopefully in 2016, the LEAD initiative. And I wanted to know how LEAD, as it, the model is currently implemented, supporting immigrants around this issue. And if not, that's good for me to know so I can advocate around addressing that when I go back home. And the other question is, um, this also applies for under the age of 18 minors, I imagine. Um, they're included in that statistic of 34,000. No, it's a little bit more complicated. It's a little bit more complicated. Juvenile offenses don't count as convictions in the same way, but they can still, the crazy thing is for immigration, even conduct can count. Like. Um, you, anyway, I'm not going to get into the weeds. It's so easy for me to get into the weeds, but... Um, uh, I'm not actually familiar with the, the LEAD initiative. Can you tell me a little bit about that for I, the audience? Actually, the, one, of the, one of the cool things about being at this conference is that we can draw on experts that are sitting in the audience. So one of my colleagues here uh, who, who abandoned DPA, who's still a little sore about that, uh, but Monica, come on up here. Uh, Monica Alt who is one of our resident experts on lead and a public defender yes. or prosecutor, public defender now. public defender, criminal defense. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, in New Mexico actually can speak to the issue of lead. Yeah. Hi, thanks. Um, so with lead, I can speak to it in Santa Fe specifically in New Mexico. Um, immigration, it's actually a good tool for, for this sort of thing because, um, well, Santa Fe is already the officers, they're not asking for um, papers, for example. Um, so somebody could be undocumented and be in lead and there wouldn't be immigration consequences because they're not involved in the criminal justice system. As far as Seattle is concerned, um, I know that there was something written into their protocols um, that stated that they weren't going to, um, there wasn't going to be immigration consequences for people that are involved with LEAD, but I'm not sure how many participants that they have that actually would have, um, that would be impacted by that. What does LEAD stand for? So it, it stands for Law Enforcement Assisted Diversion. 
Um, and it's where police actually can divert low-level drug offenders from incarceration into uh, services. Some say it's coerced treatment. Um, I would probably agree with that to a certain extent, but it's not, you're not filtered into the criminal justice system. There's no record, there's no nothing. Um, there's not even an arrest record um, if they're doing it right. Um, but it would need to be written into the protocol so that um, all the um, actors at the table would then um, be on board with it. So can I just, Thank you. Can I just uh, add Monica. something to that? Yeah. Um, so I just want to say that I think LEAD is really exciting, and I, exactly for the reasons um, Monica stated. Um, one thing that happened during the course of our debate, and I think might have been a factor in the governor's veto of 1351, is he said, well, if someone doesn't have the threat of an immediate conviction, like they haven't already pleaded guilty, then what, you know, is there a sufficient incentive to complete the program? And I think there's, like anyone who's interested in LEAD, anyone who's interested in non-coercive treatment, we all need to be educating people like the governor on why it can still work. Actually, and I'm glad you bring that up. I'm, I'm gonna come right back to you, brother. Orita, um, welcome together. I'm actually gonna draw on the expertise of somebody else uh, our DPA state director in California, this concept, this idea that you need the hammer. I know this is one of your favorite topics, Len. Why don't you talk to the audience a little bit about why this is just, for lack of a better description, a stupid-ass concept. There's, there's really nothing else to say other than that. <laughs> there was a great panel yesterday on coerced treatment. I don't know, how many people were there in that panel? Okay, coerced treatment because that's really what the hammer is about. Um, and it's this idea that if you don't um, threaten someone who may have a drug addiction or may just be a drug user, if you don't threaten them with felony and prison time that they then won't seek, uh, they won't seek and therefore they won't get drug treatment. And so first of all, we just have to demythologize that. Um, and we've been providing drug treatment, substandard drug treatment through the criminal justice system to poor people for, you know, the last 50, 60 years while people of more means can access real evidence-based gold standard drug treatment through the private system, and that's just wrong. So um, I think what, what we need to do is... Uh, in California, we recently passed Prop 47, and simple drug possession is now a misdemeanor. What we're hearing from law enforcement officials, but a lot of people in the public health and the public defender community as well, well, now we can't get people into drug treatment. Now we're, we, are, we are doing a disservice uh, to people who may have drug addiction issues. And, and I don't think that's true. I think Obamacare, the ACA, provides a tremendous opportunity to provide uh, drug treatment outside of the criminal justice system. It's going to take a few years to build it up, but we can absolutely do it. And we just have to stand back and push back that narrative every single time we hear it. And, and by the way, there's better results are not... You gave me the mic. Better results are not... Right? You know, she's, the, she's the boss. <laughs> Um, uh, it, there is no evidence that coerced treatment gets better results than voluntary treatment. So we're really, um, we're, we're violating someone's human rights and not helping them anymore. You know, and she's right. Um, I did let go of the mic for, for two people. And that's Monica, in case I ever need a public defender in New Mexico. And, and Lynn, who's actually my boss. Compañero. Pregunta. Eh. Yo, no es más que pregunta, es hacer un análisis un poco del contexto de la migración con la, con la guerra, desde otro enfoque. I just want to make a quick analysis, uh, put in context uh, with another focus on the uh, war on drugs. Es decir, tenemos hoy en, en México, por ejemplo, yo soy mexicano, una guerra instalada donde las familias están siendo deshumanizadas, donde la migración no se va a acabar porque es un país lleno de desigualdad. Today in Mexico we have a, um, a war that uh, dehumanizes people and a, a war that's not going to allow immigration to end uh, because there is uh, inequality. Mucha de la sociedad norteamericana o el gobierno lo que no alcanza a ver es que mucha gente que en México hoy es delincuente hoy está matando los mexicanos en una guerra que él incrustó en nuestro país, va a terminar en 5, en 10 años, no sé, X, pero esas personas mexicanas que deshumanizadas van a llegar nuevamente a Estados Unidos, 
así como matan mexicanos, van a empezar a matar los norteamericanos. And uh, what, uh, what he's saying is that uh, a lot of the folks in Mexico who have been swept up in organized crime and are, um, are, are living in, uh, in difficult conditions as a result of this war um, are in fact eventually going to impact uh, people on this side of the border uh, as much as they've impacted their own citizenry uh, at home. Más allá de un problema de salud, de un problema de, de, de tráfico de drogas, estamos construyendo un mundo totalmente violento, disfrazado en el discurso de querer atacar una sola planta, creando la violencia humana y la transformación en gente desde los 10 a 15 años de edad, que eran unos ángeles antes de tener estas armas y ser tan violentos como hoy son. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> Go with that, right? Um, can you describe? No, I know how to try. Se me fue, a mí también. A ver, dime una vez más. You can do it. Sí. Sí. No, pero todavía otra vez. No, no, no. Otra vez. Yeah, we all ah, okay. eh, más allá de verlo como un problema de tráfico de drogas de migración, tenemos un problema realmente de fondo, de descomposición humanitaria a los niños que hoy tienen 10 años o 15 años. So more than a problem that um, is based on drug trafficking and migration, we have a huge problem of complete human decomposition. We're seeing kids that are maybe 10 or 15 years. Yo conozco amigos míos que eran personas sanas que hasta hasta su niñez podían soñar con una vida digna y a muchos los han matado por ser sicarios. Es la única manera de sobrevivir en tanta desigualdad en México para algunos. I've had friends that were very healthy people that when they were young, they were dreaming of a dignified life and now they've been killed because of being criminals and uh, in Mexico, uh, because there's so much inequality, sometimes this is the only way to, to make a living. Sí. Por un lado tenemos muchos corazones como nosotros que tengo mis familias desaparecidas, lastimados y resentidos, pero que aprendimos a perdonar. Pero por otro lado tenemos una comunidad totalmente lastimada, con un enfoque de violencia para quitarle la vida, quemar, degollar a personas. Eso es un tema verdaderamente preocupante, porque esa violencia se va a trasladar a quien la creó, a Estados Unidos. So on one side, we have many hearts, like the heart of my family. Uh, we have uh, people in our family that have been disappeared, and these are hearts that are very hurt by this. But we've been able to learn how to forgive. But we also have a whole other segment of society that is also hurt by what's happening. And what they're doing is beheading people and killing people. And this violence is eventually going to Uh, come to the other side of the border and come to the U.S. Gracias. Thank you very much. I actually... Um, um, no, if, my, I, if I may add something please, very Marco, quickly. Please, Marco, um, please. And by the way, Marco, before, we yes. do have plenty of time, so we'll be able to take a lot more questions. We're way... Uh, we, we, we have plenty of time, so go ahead. If I may add to what just Juan Carlos you said, he, he, he was a migrant himself. He's back in Mexico, and now he's in the search of four of his brothers who are missing, who have been disappeared. And uh, I, we're, we're calling, we're trying to organize, or we are organizing, not trying, a caravan for next year, right before on gas. And we want to do this because uh, we want to make it very clear 
that we are one regional family. And every, every uh, day, the, uh, the conditions under which we are, we're living are much more similar. And uh, every day we're becoming more of a family uh, affected by the same issues, whether it's in California or whether it's in Guatemala. And uh, this war is obviously transnational, and so the, tr the solution has to be transnational. And solidarity has to be transnational, and that discussion has to be uh, from that same approach. So uh, it's going to be very, very, uh, very powerful from Honduras to New York, arriving uh, for the ONGAS in April next year. If you want to learn more, just let me or let us know to, to any of my compañeros that are around here. Would you please raise your hand just to know who's the caravan 2016 for next year? Okay. Great. Thank you, Marcos. Uh, Marco, um, actually, let, let me jump in there and, and take moderator privilege here. Actually, last night, um, a bunch of us went out to the lawn to participate and listen to a speak out where, you know, this brother and, and others uh, spoke on this issue of, of the disappeared and, and those who have been uh, impacted on such a personal level. And I got to say, you know, I was with uh, my friend and colleague, uh, Leslie and Eunice and others, and, you know, I've been navigating th these waters of the war on drugs for some time now. And, you know, yesterday was perhaps one of the most impactful experiences I, I'd listened to uh, and heard. And, and I've, you know, I, I've, been, I've, I've been witness to, to some of these devastating effects firsthand. Uh, I, too, have lost family to the war on drugs uh, who have been uh, violently murdered. Um, but I want to bring it back and kind of put it in context. And Grace, the collateral consequences when you have a parent that's removed, right? We know what it's like. Well, maybe many of us might not to lose a loved one, you know, and many of us can't even fathom the idea what it is like to, dis to have one disappeared or have him violently murdered in many ways that are just undescribable. But we also have a form of violence here that's not comparable but nonetheless impactful, and that is through these ridiculous drug laws that result in the separation of families. Your report has that title in part. Um, can you tell us a little bit more about what your experiences were in terms of all the others affected and how they're affected? I know you touched on it there, but expand on it a little bit more. The collateral consequences of separating families, migrant families here in this country. Uh, so the consequences are many. Uh, financial, obviously. Um, often it's the primary breadwinner who ends up deported. Is there a question? No, no, they're oh, asking oh. me to move this. Oh, okay. Um, there's, uh, um, it's emotional. Um, there are especially children. You know, I think all the effects that we, um, you know, I think there have been a fair number of studies on how children are affected when parents are incarcerated. I think a lot of times the effects of children when their parents are deported are very similar. Um, they don't necessarily understand why their parent has been um, deported. Uh, all they know is that they're not there. Um, I've had many people tell me they actually came back illegally after being deported because their daughter got pregnant. Their son ended up on, you know, using drugs. Their, something made them really nervous and worried about what was going to happen to their kids. Um, and all these kids, most of them are U.S. citizens. The U.S. is stuck with them. We can't deport this problem away. Um, and I think people are really not realizing that, um, you know, I think that when, when you hear that a non-citizen is being deported for a drug offense, I think most people just assume it's, oh, there's that foreign drug cartel leader, someone who's just not at all a part of our world. Um, and it's just not the case. It's... Um, it's someone that is very much um, deeply rooted in this country, um, deeply rooted in their community and in their family. And, uh, and if we, and so the effects of deporting them um, multiply on the generations. And the Mexican and Salvador and Honduran and Nicaraguan government is doing nothing once they, yes, the, the yes. families are yeah. being sent Yeah, and you know, I've so many times, I mean, if you want to, like if you go to Tijuana, there's heartbreak on every corner just standing there. I mean, people who 
have no idea how to survive there, kids who grew up in the US. Anyone with any tattoo, whether it's actually gang affiliated or not, is they're terrified. I mean, I've met people who are in sweltering heat and they're wearing buttoned up shirts, you know, um, sleeves rolled down so that they can hide all their tattoos. I had one guy tell me, thank God I never got one on my neck, <laughs> you know. Um, I mean, it's uh, one thing that's sort of a, a, a very telling development. Um, a lot of um, call centers have sprung up in Mexico because there's so many fluent English speakers who can do customer service uh, uh, at very cheap cost for U.S. companies there. Um, it's, uh, yeah, it just keeps going, you know, and in some ways, you know, the, the influx of Central American mothers and children that we've seen um, in recent years, they're fleeing severe violence in El Salvador, Honduras, Guatemala, it, violence that we largely exported. I mean, those were um, gang members who often grew up in places like LA, who we deported to those countries. And then now, you know, we're seeing, um, you know, when you don't address, when you think that you can just incarcerate a problem away or deport a problem away, it's gonna come back to you. Um, and I think we're starting to see that in the, in the criminal justice context. And we really have to acknowledge that in the immigration context as well. Thank, thank you, Grace. Question over here. First of all, uh, to my brothers and sisters in Arizona, Arizona is actually the highest uh, uh, increase in uh, voter registration amongst Latinos, uh, more so than California, more so than Texas, more so than Cali uh, Colorado, more, more so than even Florida. Um, and so uh, that uh, speaks to an increase, uh, hopefully, but now to convince our Latino brothers and sisters in Arizona to um, uh, join um, uh, marijuana reform is, as we're finding out in California, um, uh, not easy, and we definitely have our, our work cut out for us. Now, the question is to the attorneys, is, is there a way that, um, uh, you know, you, you have the story of Jose who thought everything was hunky-dory, and 13 years later, you know, he's being thrown out. Is there a way to um, uh, 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 go to a drug diversion program and then come back and enter a, um, a plea, probably no contest, so that you don't have this happen to you? Uh, and how does that work? How, does that work on a national level, legislative level, local level? So that's uh, exactly what we were trying to do in California, was to change a program that required you to plead guilty first and then um, have your charges dismissed. Um, changing that to a pre-plea model or, you know, you plead not guilty um, so that you don't end up with a conviction under federal immigration law. And I think those of us who are interested in non-coercive diversion programs, law enforcement is diversion, we should join forces because there are many reasons, not just immigration reasons, for wanting to see more of that kind of model. And I think, you know, there are counties, there are drug courts, you know, who do non-plea. I don't know how many of them do it well. I don't know, you know. I think there's a lot more to learn. There's a lot more to research. Um, there's a lot more to share and educate with people. Um, but I really, you know, I think that there's a lot of places where our interests in, can overlap, not necessarily even, you know, because we all have the same direct um, goals. And I think pre-plea diversion, non-coercive diversion is a place where we really should get together. And just briefly speaking on that, um, once you get deported from this country, it is virtually impossible to come back, period. No matter how many programs you do, no matter if you're a model citizen. Um, our immigration system has a lot of discretion to decide who it does and does not deport. But in the context of drug offenses, that discretion essentially evaporates. And we've had you know, the federal agency in charge with deportation saying, you know, we these people should not be a priority, you know. It's a drug conviction from 20 years ago. It serves no purpose to disrupt this family. But because Congress tells us we have to go after these people, we're going to detain and deport them. So it's an ongoing battle. Question on this side. Um, sorry. I just uh, wanted to uh, put the emphasis that it's not what's happening on one side or the other side of the border, but that it's a cycle that's continuously feeding itself on both sides at the same time. People who are migrating and fleeing drug war violence in Central America and Mexico, and especially people from Central America who have to cross Mexico, being a migrant, having the vulnerabilities that being a migrant 
crossing through a country that is going through a violent conflict as Mexico is, places them in specific vulnerable situations. They have found many mass graves of migrants who were probably detained, forced to work, and then murdered. And it's really hard for their families to actually keep track of them because they're going through. So they're the most vulnerable people. Once they get to the United States, they have to face all of this. And then when they're deported, they are not sent back to their homes in the places they were um, that they originally came from. It's not like the United States government is placing them back there, but they're um, they're put putting them, uh, they're releasing them on this side of the border in places that are also really vulnerable because of drug war violence. So it's a cycle that continues to go over and over again. So maybe we need to stop talking about the different sides of the border, and we need to forget the border. I mean, we not forget it. We know it's there. We know the symbol and the the power that that represents. But we need to stop thinking of it as like it, the problem starts here, stops at the border, and then on the other side of the border, that's another problem. We need to think of it as something that goes together. And my question would be, and this is something I've been thinking about during the whole conference, is now that we're starting to take down prohibition, little by little, how do we tie the real drug war into the end of prohibition? The drug war that only uses prohibition as an excuse and as a cover-up for a whole lot of other things. And how do we tie it up so that they can't find another cover-up to keep attacking our communities when we take down prohibition? Well, thank you, and that poses a real good question because, you know, that's a great question because I can certainly speak to having had, and I'll go to you guys or anybody here if you want to, put up a response, there's a lot of you guys here who are issue experts on that area. I've definitely had that conversation and debate with my own colleagues. Is ending the prohibition of marijuana gonna open up the door to other replacements, i.e., we can say other drugs, other issues, extortion? In fact, uh, I was speaking with somebody at this conference, she's not here, who was discussing how there's an increase in, I think, methamphetamines in Colorado. She is uh, a member of the one of the Colorado collectives and was speaking to that issue. Um, but let me ask you guys this, and, and you might feel comfortable responding to this. Um, there's clearly a lot of analysis that needs to happen. And I think one of the challenges, one of the positive things about why we continue to have these conversations is because Every time we have these conversations, uh, we're bringing in new folks into the fold. But for some of us who've been battling this issue for months, if years, it can be frustrating, right? Or we're still at this conversation. So, you know, it speaks to the challenge of how do we continue to have this and continue to bring people into the fold, but at the same time, how do we advance so as to not feel that we're still back stuck on this same issue? And Marco, you make the argument that we need to have you know, you've been working the issue as a transnational issue, right? And clearly the analysis from Mexico is one that maybe a lot of us born and raised on this side of the, of the border have a hard time conceptualizing and vice versa. How do we bring together that analysis? Is it an economic one through observations of how NAFTA has contributed to the free flow of of products? Is it one that's rooted in migration? Is it one that's rooted in the corruption of politics? Well, I would have to say that it's, as, as Amaya just said, it's just thinking that we are part of the same community. It's not, it's not uh, every day is less of a foreign policy issue, and every day it's more of a, of a uh, shared community. Uh, as long as we are just fighting at the local level, without pursuing that these local victories uh, contribute to regional solutions, then we are being blind or we're just, we will be just seeing uh, partial victories that might legitimize the system to keep oppressing in other ways in other places. So we gotta be really careful when we think about local victories because it might be, uh, uh, the feed for other 
communities. In Mexico, for example, with the recent legislation or whatever it's happening at the court with marijuana, it's very interesting because it, it almost seems like under the current human rights crisis that Mexico is going through, somebody like like the US has been advising the Mexican government to follow a democratic agenda among which the legalization of marijuana fits in perfectly in order to re-legitimize other kinds of oppressions that are happening at the same time. So thinking transnationally mean, means that how my local victory can contribute to other regional victories or, or of a regional language off. All right, so let me, uh, let me put this out there, right? Again, taking moderator privilege here. Considering that this gathering here this week, 1,400, 1,500 people from all over the world, is perhaps the premier, if not the premier, right, Daniel? Reform, drug policy reform gathering in the world. Considering that we are in the belly of the beast of the consumer nation, where the causes of this devastating war on drugs is being generated, both economically, politically, consumerism. Should this organization then take more direct steps in leading reform at this level, at the migration level? At, because look, let's be honest, one panel, the first panel I think we've ever had exclusively on this issue. Right? I mean, what I'm hearing people describe here, not the first panel? <laughs> but, okay, but, 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 right, right. We, we've been working on it. But the point I'm getting at is the reason, I was thinking in terms of the first panel, specifically looking at ways that we're trying to change immigration policies here locally. And, and in that regard, so I guess what I'm trying to say is, you know, can we come out of here? And look, you guys have the power of the uh, review forms, right, Charlotte? Everybody has a review form here that says session evaluation. You know, there's nothing stopping you from saying, look, you know, what I heard today is X, Y, and Z, and what we need to do is to ensure that this organization takes greater steps, more bigger steps, and ensuring that this conversation continues to develop analysis, that this organization takes direction and leadership and ensuring that this issue is taken on a transnational level and that we affect change. And that might very well include the time for the reform movement to start taking positions and no longer treat this issue as a third rail issue. We're afraid. Maybe it's time that this organization start looking towards its other partners who are afraid and even fucking anti-immigrant and say, join the party. Because the majority of us here are not anti-immigrant. The majority of us here are not a two-issue system. I had one question here. This brother right here. And I'm going to go one, two, three. Come back to you guys. So my question for you is, how can we eventually get to federal reform and possibly get to a point where we can offer clemency to people who have been exported and get the possibility that may be coming back? Is that something that might be possible in the future, later down the road? Jose? <laughs> so I think that's a great question. Actually, in the last major immigration reform bill, there was a provision that would have allowed a certain number of previously deported individuals to come back. But in that bill, the grounds for deportation were also expanded again. The problem is once you criminalize someone, it's, it's very hard for you to take away those offenses. And so I think the conversation that we need to have with um, our allies is, hey, you know, it's not enough that you're you know, legalizing the 11 million people in the nation. You have to scale back the criminalization of immigrants in existing law. And I think a really great way to do that and to move those efforts forward, and that touches on a previous question, is to build a large coalition of different interested parties. Whether you're in this for the economic benefits or you know, your moral beliefs or you work with Ban the Box and you want less people to have convictions so that's not as big of a problem. I read an article about, I think it was a very, very white town in Vermont and they were having lots of heroin <laughs> overdoses and the, the sheriff was like, we gotta get these people treatment. Like, we can't lock them up. And it's like, 
Vermont, yes, very. And so I think maybe looping, welcoming them, being like, welcome, we've been here for the last 20 years. But All whatever right. it takes to get you here. Um, we, we're winding down. We're down to about nine minutes, Charlotte. I just had an epiphany. I feel like a fucking talk show host. <laughs> I don't know if that's a good thing. Uh, we're about nine minutes. Let's stick to the question, please. I know we have a lot to say, but just let's do the question. I'm, I'm from India, and it's really wonderful to hear this. I have two questions. One is, you know, I'd read a report a few years ago issued by a very prominent um, drug policy reform and human rights-oriented organization, which talked about how Amsterdam had for some time this policy where someone who was caught with drugs at the airport was immediately deported and wasn't processed in the criminal justice system. And that was sort of put out as a good practice as sort of reducing the excesses and a slightly more proportionate response to drugs as opposed to criminalizations. Now, now, you know, hearing all of you, I'm just wondering whether that indeed is good practice considering the very serious implications of deportation. Thank you. Hold that thought. So is deporting people immediately at the time you catch them at the airport, in other words, pick them up, put them back on a plane, send them back home, is that an alternative? Let's try and get a question, one more, maybe two more, and we'll go back to the panelists for closing statements and answers. Oh, okay. Um, the, we know it's a big step for a lot of groups that are working on specific policies to move and to begin to integrate immigration with the drug policy, and that was, that's what this panel is all about. But it, we can't explain what we're facing to ourselves, and we can't explain it really very well to anybody else unless we do see that big p picture. The big picture can appear overwhelming, but in that sense, the question is, or rather a statement, how to what degree can we integrate, and we have to integrate foreign policy as well. As long as we're funding the exportation of these drug wars, now we find that even more so than any time in the past, the reason people are coming from the Northern Triangle, from Central America, and because it's more Central American than Mexican immigration now, is violence. It was always poverty, and now it's violence. And much of that is caused by the imposition of the drug war model. The drug war there has always been, and here and there, whether it's jail, whether it's, whether it's the violence of a militarization of our countries, I'm from Mexico, is a question of social control. That's what it is, and, I just, and, and one of the things that Juan Carlos said that didn't get translated is, we are building a violent world cloaked in the discourse of attacking a plant. Okay, one more question, anybody out there? One more question, we got about five minutes to go, and we'll go to anybody who wants to make, I know I, I said to you, there's three questions, I'll take the last three and that's it. Hi, um, so I, something that Jose said um, when you said that folks are being deported that the government are, is saying that are not a priority, um, made me think about um, the detention bed quota. Right now there's 34,000, uh, the quota is the detention centers need to hold 34,000 people um, every single day, right? And we have folks like the Corrections Corporation of America who are like literally profiting off the suffering of immigrant families. And I'm wondering to what degrees you think those things are related and to what degree you think that we can or cannot tackle um, drug deportations without tackling the privatization and profiting off of immigrant suffering. Okay, so the questions are getting bigger. <laughs> Um, I'm going to take the last two. I'm sorry if we don't get to all the answers. And then I'm going to turn it over to you guys for closing statements and answers as you see fit. Last two questions. So I'm an American-born Puerto Rican, and so I think we have a particularly interesting role to play in the immigration debate. But I'm also on the board of the Minority Cannabis Business Association, so I'm wondering what policies you all think we should be insisting on as the burgeoning industry comes out and as we push more legalization forward in order to make sure that communities of color are benefiting from legalization. Great question. How do we get the benefits? And then the last question, Karen. Let's see if you can remember all of these. Um, <laughs> okay. Um, my question is, um, I have a lot of friends who are Latino, so they obviously know a lot more about the community than I do. Um, and from my understanding of it is that um, 
immigration is at the forefront of their concerns, not so much the drug war. Um, and it's almost like very anti-drugs, like, you know, like, fine, like, we don't want you smoking, we don't want you doing this, like, very, very seriously against, like, the whole drug movement. Um, so how would you suggest presenting, like, the drug war in this, I guess, the immigration frame um, to show that these things are actually very um, closely tied together um, and that one really f affects the other one? So why don't we take one question each, <laughs> closing statements, <laughs> and um, we'll say thank you. Jose, so go I'm going to speak to all of those questions in, in kind of a theme. I'm going to give a thematic answer, and that is how do we go about making systematic change? And I think the answer is twofold. The answer is love and inform. And what I mean by love is, I have a very dear friend of mine, her name is Gabby Pacheco, she is an immigrant advocate, um, she's not supposed to be in the country either, and she reaches out to all sorts of constituencies and tries to understand them. She tried to hug Ann Coulter, and Ann Coulter <laughs> refused to hug her on national TV. Um, and she was doing legislative visits one time on the Hill, and she ran into an anti-immigrant group doing visits on the opposite side. And after about like half an hour of talking, and she was like, you know, I'm undocumented, I'm not supposed to be here. And they said, well, no, 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 we don't wanna deport you, Gabby. We wanna deport the bad immigrants. And I think sharing your narrative and connecting and explaining is very helpful, which is what a lot of the dreamers did in getting their narrative to the forefront. And the reason we have so many of these problems is people do not understand how our immigration system works. People do not understand that our federal government is detaining people because Congress said you have to detain X number of people regardless of what they did. If we had a law like that in the criminal justice system where they said you have to keep 34,000 people in prison regardless of the severity of their crime. So if you don't have enough serious people, you go down to the people who are littering that's what we have in our immigration system. And explaining those nuances, that there is no line, that these consequences are devastating, is the first step to bringing about systematic change. We're, we're down to about um, two minutes. We're down to about two minutes, so maybe you guys can spare a minute and give me 10 seconds to say thank you, goodbye. And right now is the best time to start filling these out, ladies and gentlemen. Make sure you uh, put in there how how good and handsome the moderator was, all right? I'll turn it over to you, Grace. Uh, I don't know, I think I would just really concur with everything Jose said. Um, and you know, working from a, a human rights perspective, um, we actually have a new policy, a newish policy that we came out with uh, in the last year calling for the decriminalization of um, drugs for personal use and possession for personal use. Um, and it came out of all our research on how the harms of the drug war have affected um, with violence, with um, disproportionate you know, racial impact in the US criminal justice system, in abusive practices and rehabilitation centers around the world. Um, and I think when we, to me that's the core that should unite all of us. It's about the inherent dignity of any human being, no matter what the offense was, you know, uh, what their immigration status is, what country they live in now. Um, and I think if we can keep that at our focus, then I think we'll find that we have a lot in common. And um, Marco closes out. And before you run out, I want to make one last quick statement. Marco. Yes, well, I agree with, with Jose by saying that it's all about family and love behind both uh, criminalization, violence, and immigration. And definitely try not to uh, accept uh, that others go through something that you wouldn't want to go through. And uh, don't forget that Mexicans are growing in the U.S. and maybe we will create an immigration bill. <laughs> yes. <laughs> and, and no, but, but what, I, what I truly want to say is that I've heard in this, uh, in this conference more, more than once that right now after some local victories around marijuana now, uh, instead of buying from, from your your colored friend or relative, now you're buying from a white dispensary. And so that, that is why local pieces of legislation have to address the rest of the issues of inequality and racism in this country and in the region. Otherwise, it's not, we're, we're gonna be here in three years having another discussion about a new trend, but the, but the systemic problem will, will stay there. So uh, that, is, that is why from being hyper-specialist, 
That's how we had to advance as progressive thinking. Now we have to go to a moment where we, we consider and understand the different uh, dimensions of the, of the same problem. And ladies and gentlemen, that is a great way to end this. With, on that note, uh, I do want to encourage you guys. This is your reform conference. This is your movement. You know, take a step forward. Demand that we expand these type of workshops have intermediate, have introductory, have advanced conversations and discussions where we do take action steps. And on that note, on behalf of the Drug Policy Alliance, um, everybody who is here, I want to thank you very much for not only being at this conference, but joining us here today. And my name is Armando Gudino, and I wanna thank Marco, Grace, Jose, and thank you all for being here. And I've always wanted to do this, I'm out.